and the pediatric and the endocrine pool. And uh, I'm Haya Al Khayyab. I'm a senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist and associate professor at the RCSI in Bahrain. And I'm glad to introduce my co chair, Dr. Aisha Sinani. She's a colleague as well. Uh, Dr. Aisha is a senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist, and she's the head of the Pediatric and Endocrine Cent National Center. And uh, she's the head of the Pediatric uh, and Endocrine Center and the Royal Hospital as well. Our session consists of four presentations. Each presentation uh, will be about 25 minutes, and we'll leave the discussion till the end for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we're glad that we have distinguished speakers today, and please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Jan Martin Wendt. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of Pediatric at Well Alexander Children's Hospital at Leiden University. Uh, Professor Wett studied medicine at Leiden University and then specialized in pediatric and pediatric endocrinology at Rotterdam and uh, at Sofia Children's Hospital in Rotterdam. He is the founder of the Piro of the Dutch Growth Research Foundation and the Dutch Growth Hormone Advisory Group. Uh, Professor Wett, uh, under his supervision, 47 PhD students have defended their thesis, and he authored more than 700 publications, and he received many medals and awards. So let's all welcome Professor Martin today, and uh, Professor Martin is going to talk about update on delayed property. So, Professor Martin, the floor is yours. You're welcome. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to speak with you on delayed puberty. And I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. So, here are some disclosures. I'm a member of several advisory boards and speakers' fees, but not on this topic. The agenda for today is a workup of the male adolescent with delayed puberty. And I will also speak shortly on a novel form of delayed puberty, which we have been calling disharmonious puberty. Let me start with a case. So a 14.1 year old boy with delayed puberty. Medical history, no pubertal signs, some weight gain, no relatives with delayed puberty. And at physical exam, he appears indeed younger than his age. He's slightly overweight, gynecomastia, of course, no tenor stages, uh, or actually tenor stages one, testicular volume three mils and no axillary hair. If one looks at the gross pattern, you will see that there is a deceleration between six and 14 years of about one SD loss. And sitting height height ratio is minus 1.4, which indicates relatively long legs. And the arm span height ratio is plus 1.7, which indicates relatively long arms. So the first workup in this case was a testosterone, LH and FSH, and you can see it is all very low. And bone age is two years uh, delayed. Now for all these measurements, one needs, of course, reference data. And I just show this slide to indicate that we have indeed reference data for testicular volume. For the arcidometer at the left side and ultrasound at the right side. It's important to note that the mills for the arcidometer are other mills than for the ultrasound. So it's always important to indicate the method that you have been using actually, if you report on the testicular volume. And you can see that for this patient, he has a too low testicular volume for his age. So what's the definition of delayed puberty? It's a lack of initial signs of puberty at an age that is two or 2.5 as these beyond the population mean. And it's important to note that the pubic hair is not part of the definition. 
And traditionally, the age cutoffs are 13 years in girls and 14 years in boys. In this talk, I will only discuss the situation in boys. So what's a diagnostic approach? There are four steps to take. And the first is remember the relevant causes of delayed puberty. So one has to know what to look for. Step two is then ask the relevant questions in the <clears throat> medical history and check the relevant issues at physical exam and the gross pattern analysis. And step three is a laboratory and radiological assessment. And four, further diagnostic studies have indicated, for example, uh, genetic analysis. So step one is what is the differential diagnosis of delayed puberty in males? Actually, there are three main causes. It's the hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, and that is easily picked up because LH and FSH are increased. Then one has hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and these can be subdivided in acquired functional congenital. And then there's the most frequent form, self-limited delayed puberty or constitutional delay of growth and puberty. And as you can see, this is about 60 or 80% of the cases. In the congenital hypogonadism, HAs, as I will abbreviate, there are gene defects found in usually about 50%. And there's a panel, a gene panel actually, that can be used for this. There are also gene variants associated with the self-limited delayed puberty indicated here, but that's more for the research perspective. So this is the flow chart actually that one can use them. So one has a boy with delayed puberty, testicular volume below four mils at more than 14 years. One collect diagnostic clues for the various uh, forms. One does screening, LH, FSH, bone age, testosterone. And already at this stage, one can pick up the primary hypogonadism. And then of course, there is a situation of that there are positive clues for acquired or functional HH, maybe positive clues for CHH, or there are no indications whatsoever. So what are these clues? Are there red flags for an organic or congenital HH? Here are some of them. Transfusion, regime, corticosteroids, chemotherapy, etc. So things that you can easily pick up from the medical history. There are also red flags for the congenital HH. For example, micropenis and or cryptorchidism in the medical history or at physical exam. And of course, the well-known anosmia and hyposmia because of Kalman syndrome. And there are several other abnormalities that can indicate an increased risk for CHH. So we are now one step further. One has already picked up the clues for the acquired and functional HH, maybe do some specific testing, and then you have a diagnosis maybe of acquired or functional hypogonadism. If there are no such clues, and there may be clues for the congenital one, usually people do a lab laboratory investor rage test and inhibin B. And let's see actually what the data show. Is this a very good uh, tool? It's not so good, but it helps a little bit. So you can see there is a difference between the mean of the LH peak between the CHH and the constitutional delay, but there is a large overlap. But still, if there um, is a peak below four international units per liter, then it is very unlikely that there is constitutional delay. You can also see that it's a little bit dependent on testicular volume. And how about inhibin B? 
again, an enormous overlap between the two conditions. Doesn't make too much of a difference in the various testicular volumes. But again, it is very unlikely if there is a constitutional delay is inhib if inhibit B is below 35 picogram per mil. So we are here now. Based on this testing, one can suspect a constitutional delay or one can suspect a CHH. In the latter case, one does MRI and genetic test if possible, and it can lead to a confirmation of CHH. If one thinks of the constitutional delay, the next step is a short testosterone treatment. And if done, testicular volume is increasing and testosterone, spontaneous testosterone, of course, normalizes, one can think this is constitutional delay. If there is an insufficient response, one goes on to CHH. What was the situation in our case? At physical exam, there was a testicular volume at 16 years at four mils. So there was some progress, but actually very slow. Sitting height, height and arm span still in the same range. Bone age still two years delayed. And one can see we did already an MRI at that point and it was normal. And you can see that the lab was still low. The LH peak was eight and inhibin was 110. So we still didn't know for sure. We did the puberty induction with 125 milligram testosterone every four weeks. And there was a rather good response in terms of testicular volume, 10 mils, but testosterone remained low. So it was decided to still do the genetic testing and we found compound heterozygosity for two pathogenic GnRH R variants. So this shows how difficult it can be actually to differentiate between the um, congenital HH and the constitutional delay. Now it's time for another case. A 15.2 year old boy with normal testicular development, but a low plasma testosterone. The medical history show that he was born large for gestational age. Um, he had central hypothyroidism that was picked up already as a neonate and of course on medication with L-tyroxine. He had a gross deceleration between six and 15 years of 1.3 SDS and he was rather overweight as you can see, a BMI of 1.9 SDS. There was a normal timing of testicular volume that is showed at the right side, but a severe delay of pubic hair and plasma testosterone. So we can see at 11 years, testicular volume, 4 mil, but still undetectable testosterone. At 14.4, stage 2 pubic hair and still testosterone of only 0 0.8 nanomol per liter. At physical exam at 15 years, there was even 20 mils of testicular volume and still this very low testosterone with a normal GnRH test, as you can see. What is happening here? But let's first look at the differentiation of this height curve. This is all in SDS. So this is height SDS by H. And let's see now the cubic hair is actually very similar to the height pattern in terms of SDS. And you can see that the SDS of the testicular volume is completely normal. So you have this differentiation between pubic hair and testosterone, and you have it in testicular volume. But if you're interested to calculate SDS for pubertal signs, you can look at puberty plots, TNO, and we also published it in the paper of Joustra et al. This is, ladies and gentlemen, an IGSF1 deficiency, immunoglobulin factor one. So this is 
particularly characterized by central hypothyroidism, macroorganism, low prolactin in about half of the cases, and disharmonious puberty. So a delayed pubertal testosterone rise with an early or normal timing of testicular growth. You can see here what happens in these cases. You can see testosterone is in the lower half of the normal range or below. And you can see the testicular volume is rather high. There are, there are even some cases that have a large testis actually at a young age, but the majority in the upper half of the normal range and they end up usually with macroorganism. You can also see that in females who are heterozygous for the gene defect, they also tend to have a late menarche. And there is a delayed adrenarche as well. So you have low DHEAS, particularly if they are also prolactin deficient. So the summary of my talk is as follows. Three of the five causes of delayed puberty can, by, can be identified by clinical assessment. That's the organic and functional HH and plasma gonadotropins, the primary gonadal deficiency. The differentiation of CHH versus CDGP, so the delayed puberty, is difficult. Bone age delay and laboratory data overlap. A low dose sex steroid priming test can be used to treat constitutional delay. That has also a positive effect on adult height and for differentiating CDGP from CHH. With a targeted exome sequencing based gene panel, a gene defect can be found in 50% of cases with CHH. CDGP is also associated with several gene variants. Patients with monogenic forms of self-limited delay puberty represent, however, a minority of cases. So the genetic analysis is only valid in research setting. The combination of slow growth and low plasma testosterone in contrast with normal or increased timing of testicular growth suggests IGS-F1 deficiency syndrome. I thank you very much for your attention and I hope there is time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bro, for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, the second uh, talk will be for Prof. Zilf Miguel, and he will talk about the spectrum of rickets from childhood to adult. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you. So Prof. Zilf Miguel, he is a professor and he was graduated from the University of Liverpool. Uh, in UK, he received his postgraduate uh, in Manchester, Liverpool, in UK, and Cincinnati uh, in USA. He was appointed as a consultant in, as a pediatrician in 1988, and currently he is working as a consultant of pediatric in, in Manchester Children's Hospital. Prof. Zilf has, has an extensive experience in management of the metabolic bone disease in pediatric. And he has more than 180 uh, published uh, papers. Uh, also, Prof, he was awarded for, for his contribution to pediatric bone research. He got recently uh, his reward in June 2021, and he was awarded the Dent Award by the Bone Research Society. And also in 2015, he was awarded in Salzburg. Uh, for awarded the Charles Selimenda Award. Uh, Prof. Zilf, the uh, floor is for you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this important meeting. These are my disclosures. The objectives of today's talk is going to be to understand the pathophysiology of rickets, an approach to diagnosis of rickets, and then we are going to skip through a number of different conditions, calcipenic rickets, um, uh, uh, phosphopenic rickets, and also talk about uh, prevention and treatment of these forms of rickets. That's quite a uh, 
tall order, but I'll try and do my best to cover all this in, in, a, in the allocated time. So let's start with pathophysiology of rickets. Historically, rickets has been classified into phosphopenic rickets and uh, phosphopenic rickets and calcipenic rickets. Calcipenic rickets arises from dietary calcium deficiency or disorders of uh, that result in low 125-dihydroxyvitamin D or impaired action at the vitamin D receptor. This leads to a decrease in serum calcium, which causes high PTH, which then leads to increased um, loss of phosphate in the kidneys, uh, causing chronic hypophosphatemia. And then you've got a group of conditions uh, called phosphopenic rickets, which may be due to conditions associated with high plasma FGF23 or uh, mutations in the sodium-dependent phosphate transporters in the kidney, which result in um, phosphate loss and a number of other conditions um, where FGF23 levels may be increased or Fanconi syndrome. All these conditions lead to renal phosphate wastage, chronic hyperphosphatemia, and impaired apoptosis of terminally differentiated chondro uh, chondrocytes in the growth plate, which then leads to impaired mineralization of the growth plate and osteoid, which is what Rickett sees, and osteomalacia is impaired mineralization of the osteoid when the growth plate is closed. So the common pathway for all forms of rickets and osteomalacia is low serum phosphate value. And of course, calcium in the extracellular plasma also is important. So when we are dealing with a child who presents with rickets, it's important to take a detailed history, do oxology, um, cardiac musculoskeletal examination, dental inspection, um, radiographs of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, wrist and the knee, uh, biochemistry and genetic testing. You need to ask about inheritance pattern, if there's family history of rickets, is a history of sunshine avoidance, which might have led to vitamin D deficiency, is a dietary calcium deficiency, is a failure to thrive, which may be due to renal tubular acidosis, um, which can be associated with uh, um, rickets, uh, is a history of dental enamel hyperplasia or dental abscesses, is there a family history of nephrocalcinosis or renal stones um, or renal failure? Uh, you can do a very quick dietary calcium assessment in clinic by um, uh, working out how much milk do they drink, um, uh, amount of uh, dairy products such as cheese and yogurt, and uh, vegetables that they eat. In, in, in UK, all flour is fortified with um, uh, calcium, so we ask about history of uh, how many slices of bread or chapatis they eat. And this is work done by one of my men, our medical students, and it's published in archives. And uh, it gives you a very quick way of assessing dietary calcium intake in the clinic. Uh, biochemical workup is very important. All patients should have uh, basic biochemistry, calcium, phosphate, alkaline, phosphate is me measured. It's important to measure uh, urea and electrolytes and bicarbonate, um, especially if they've got Fanconi syndrome, PTH is important. Serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is a measure of an individual's vitamin D status, is very important. In selective cases, you may need to measure 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D and FGF23. A dip slide of the urine, if it um, has pH greater than um, uh, 7, glycosuria, amino acid urea may point to Fanconi syndrome. Assessment of TRP and TMPGFR, calcium to creatine ratio is important. And looking at urine protein to creatine ratio, low molecular weight protein is important for to diagnose dense disease. So this is the biochemical workup. So now let's turn to the diagnosis, management and prevention of calcipenic rickets, that is nutritional rickets and vitamin D dependent rickets. So let's start with case study number one. This is a male infant who was breastfed from birth um, and uh, never received any vitamin D supplements and presented at the age of two years with delayed walking. Remember that breast milk is a poor source of vitamin D. A liter of breast milk only contains uh, 40 international units of uh, vitamin D. The requirement is generally 400 to 600 units uh, daily. Um, you can see the classical um, frontal bossing. And these children are very miserable. They have swelling of the wrists. When they stand up, they develop um, um, curvature of the limbs, uh, genuvarum, and the classical radiograph showing cupping and fraying of the metaphyses 
osteopenic bones. And if you're able to see very carefully, you would see periosteal bone resorption along the diaphysis caused by high PTH. If you look at the biochemistry, then the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D is woefully low, indicating a severe vitamin D deficiency. The PTH is very high, and that high PTH has caused increased urinary phosphate loss, uh, causing um, low phosphate. It has restored or nearly restored the serum calcium to near normal values, but the alkaline phosphate is a marker of bone, to bone turnover is very high. So a typical biochemistry that we see in a child with nutritional rickets. In this case, it's nutritional rickets due to vitamin D deficiency. And as you know, um, sunlight is a main source of uh, vitamin D when it's the ultraviolet B radiation acts on the skin and leads to uh, conversion of 7-dehydroxycholesterol into cholecalciferol uh, vitamin D3. There is vitamin D2, which is also available in mushrooms and other plant sources. And uh, this slide also emphasizes the importance of uh, calcium from dairy products. But in many parts of the world, you can get rickets due to dietary calcium deficiency, even though there's abundant sunshine there. So these are cases of rickets from John Pettifor's um, work, uh, seminal work that he did in um, South Africa, but there are similar reports from Bangladesh and Nigeria. So taking a dietary history and assessing calcium is a crucial part in, in assessing um, the, uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a child with rickets. Adolescents and adults often present with uh, deformities such as uh, Gini Warren and Gini Walgen. The radiographs may not be as spectacular as in a toddler because the growth plate is about to close, but they may have these looser zones or uh, pseudo fractures which cause intense pain. And these are classical osteomalacic stress fractures, as they're called sometimes, which you often see on the medial aspect of the proximal femur. These individuals can present with tetany and convulsions, lethargy and limb pains, um, um, and, and, and this pelvic outlet and limb deformities, which I mentioned, proximal myopathy and fractures. Other features include hypocalcemic tetany and seizures, which may be associated with nutritional rickets. The, one of the most important is dilated, hypocalcemic dilated cardiomyopathy. This radiograph is taken from a child who presented to emergency department fitting and in heart failure, and in spite of uh, full resuscitation died. This is post-mortem um, chest radiograph showing a dilated heart and lung absolutely clogged with um, pulmonary <coughs> effusion. If you look at the lower limb radiograph, you can see rickets, and this is the interosseous line which was put in for resuscitation. In UK, we have two to three children dying of uh, hypocalcemic dilated cardiomyopathy caused by um, um, vitamin D deficiency. The other features are proximal myopathy, pain, failure to thrive, ghost motor development. They can get raised intracranial pressure, which probably contributes to this irritability. And we recently reported a series of cases of nutritional rickets with cranial synestosis. So the case study two is uh, one of an adult girl who I saw in 2009. She ate no dairy products at all and spent most of her time studying or on the computer. She complained of severe pain in her limbs and inability to climb stairs easily. You can see that at presentation, she had severe vitamin D deficiency, very high PTH, low calcium and high phosphate. So when you have severe dietary calcium deficiency, you can get this PTH resistance and very high alkaline phosphatase. I gave her a single oral dose of uh, vitamin D and put her on uh, um, calcium supplements. And some four weeks later, her biochemistry had significantly improved. Um, the video, which hopefully will work, um, uh, well, it hasn't worked, but would have shown that she is able to get up from standing position uh, more easily uh, after treatment. There is a global consensus um, of uh, recommendations on prevention and management of nutritional records, which is evidence-based um, uh, guideline, which was developed by thorough um, evaluation of literature and number of experts uh, which were met, which I was also involved in which provides guidance on treatment and prevention. This paper is uh, readily available 
and I will not dwell through this slide. You can get download it and, and read it, but it's very clear that you need to give this patients uh, vitamin D and enough calcium and 400 international units daily with adequate calcium supplements will help to prevent nutrition rickets. So um, let's start with case study three. This is a female infant born to consanguineous parents of Pakistani origin, which presented at the age of 14 months with motor delay, irritability and failure to thrive. You can see severe signs of uh, rickets with uh, rickety rosary, swelling of the wrists, and the radiograph showed flooded rickets with marked periostitis, this line that you can see, and pathological fractures. Um, this child had low normal calcium, very low phosphate, very high alkaline phosphatase, high PTH, normal 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and low 125-dihydroxy um, vitamin D, inappropriately low for the prevailing PTH. And so this patient had um, <clears throat> vitamin D dependent rickets type 1A, which is caused by inactivating homozygous mutations in CYP27B1, which converts 25OHD uh, 25 into 125OHD. And the treatment is initially to give them calcitriol or alpha calcidol initially at higher doses with oral calcium supplements because they have hungry bone syndromes. Once the biochemistry is normalized and there's radiological healing of rickets, you can reduce to maintenance doses of alpha calcidol and calcitriol. Uh, vitamin, D vitamin D dependent rickets type 1B is caused by mutations uh, in CYP2R1 gene, which is the main um, enzyme responsible for formation of 25-OHD in the liver. And it causes some um, uh, rickets, which is very similar to vitamin D deficiency. So this is the, um, uh, this is the sort of uh, <clears throat> the mutated uh, sort of um, gene. And it can be either by ELIC or uh, uh, some of the heterozygous also have milder forms of the rickets um, um, caused by mutations in this gene. And the treatment is with high doses of polycalciferol, or you can bypass the defect by giving them calciferol, which is 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. And, and like with vitamin D dependent rickets type 1A, they do require oral supplements until the rickets is healed. And then we go on to vitamin D dependent rickets type 2, which is due to um, end organ resistance to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D due to mutations in the uh, vitamin D receptor. And these patients um, have the deformities that you see here, uh, the radiological signs, about half of them have alopecia. Um, and the biochemistry is usually as before, but normal 25-hydroxy vitamin D and very, very high levels of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And the mutation is usually in the genes encoding the vitamin D receptor, which may be nuclear binding or the ligand binding in the domain. If they, if they have alopecia, it, they usually have more severe disease. Um, they may require IV calcium infusions uh, through infancy and toddlerhood, but the milder forms can be treated by giving them uh, large doses of oral calcium given in five to six divided doses daily. This is an interesting condition which tends to get better as they get older. And vitamin D dependent rickets type 3 uh, is due to heterozygous mutations in the CYP3A4 gene, which lead to accelerated activation of vitamin D, resulting in vitamin D deficiency. To the best of my knowledge, there are only two reported cases of this uh, very rare form of rickets. And uh, so here there is a heterozygous loss of function mutations in the gene encoding for uh, this gene, which uh, basically catabolizes 25 OHD and 125 into their metabolites, therefore causing wastage of um, the vitamin D and the rickets. They require treatment with high doses of polycalciferol. Now I'm going to turn to um, uh, management of phosphatemic rickets, and I'm going to focus on X-linked hyperphosphatemic rickets or X-linked hyperphosphatemia, abbreviated to XLH. So the last case study is one of a two and a half year old boy who presented with bow leggedness since he stood up at the age of 10 months. 
His mother was only 131 centimeters tall, had bored legs, wore partial dentures and hearing aids. She had never had a diagnosis of rickets even though, or osteomalacia, even though she had, had multiple operations on her legs. <clears throat> this boy walked with a waddling gait. He was short um, and he had sore gums and the dentist had prescribed uh, multiple courses of antibiotics. You can see the bored legs and you can see the studded chip skull caused by cranial synestosis. His um, <clears throat> main features of his biochemistry is uh, low serum phosphate, high um, uh, uh, level of calcium excretion shown by a low serum TMP GFR, and um, in the face of near normal serum uh, PTH value. The rest of the biochemistry showed high alkaline phosphatase, normal calcium, normal 25 OHD, and when FGF23 intact molecule was measured, it was found to be high. There was no minor aciduria, bicarbonate urea, glycosuria, or protein urea. So we are not dealing with Fanconi syndrome or dense disease or other similar conditions. Urine calcium to creatinine ratio was normal. So we are not dealing with mutations in the sodium dependent phosphate trans, uh, transmitters, which uh, transporters, which can cause um, hypercalciuria and hypophosphatemic rickets. So we sent off his genetics for the um, hypophosphatemic gene panel, which has all these um, genes that it tests for. And the result came back that this boy had um, uh, heterozygous mutations in the fax gene, um, confirming that he had X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. So um, <clears throat> fax is a phosphate regulating gene with homology to endopeptidases on the X chromosome. When it's mutated, it leads to high expression of FGF23, which is produced from the osteocytes and uh, osteoblasts. This then acts on the sodium-dependent phosphate transporters and uh, down-regulates them. This is uh, uh, NAPI 2A and 2C. This leads to renal phosphate wastage. High FGF23 level also leads to down-regulation of CYP27B1, and upregulation of CYP24A1, leading to low serum 125-dihydroxy vitamin D levels, which leads to intestinal malabsorption of calcium and phosphate. The net effect is uh, chronic hypophosphatemia, and uh, this then leads to impaired mineralization of the growth plate and osteoid, leading to rickets. Um, so the XLH is a multi-system disorder associated with impaired skeletal mineralization, impaired growth, impaired muscle function, bone pain, propensity to dental abscesses, premature fusion of uh, cranial sutures, and the older subjects develop <coughs> pseudo fractures or loser zones. Hearing impairment is uh, not uncommon, particularly as they get older. The adults develop these antisopathies and uh, stiffness and they go on to develop spinal um, and paraspinal uh, cal uh, ligament calcification leading to spinal um, stenosis. So the burden of this disease actually increases through adolescence and adulthood. Dental issues are very, very important, which arises from rather thin enamel with cracks in it, but the main problems with the dentine, which has got these big globules, the other problem, if you look at the uh, picture of a normal tooth and then the tooth of an XLH boy, is that the dental pulp spaces are very large and open to outside. So the germs can get from outside into the, um, into the base of the tooth, causing dental abscesses, and also these cracks and these uh, spaces into the dental pulp spaces. So they're very prone to dental abscesses, which usually present with little blebs as shown here. The other features are cranial synostosis, which may present with raised intracranial pressure, and this kihari type malformation and settings presenting with headaches and dizziness. The conventional treatment of XLH was to give them a neutral phosphate salts five to six times a day, and calcitriol or alpha calcidol, and titrating them to a normalized um, uh, alkaline phosphatase and uh, parathyroid hormone, you cannot normalize serum phosphate on this regimen. They may, may need thiazides if they get persistent hypercalciuria, synacalcid if uh, PTH is very elevated, and they do require 
guided growth treatment with hemiapifazidus as well they're uh, growing and correction of the limb deformities by osteotomy when the growth is finished. There are many problems with this treatment. Uh, the main one being that uh, phosphate is unpalatable because it's bellyache. And in spite of the best will in the world, um, you cannot fully heal the rickets in many patients uh, with this treatment. And many of these patients still required surgery. The other thing is that it causes high levels of uh, FGF23, which is then um, basically uh, uh, sort of worsens the whole cycle that I've described earlier. So the new treatment of this treatment is virizumab, which inhibits FGF23 and impro improves phosphate and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. So here you have the uh, mutated facts, which leads to uh, high serum FGF23 and virizumab binds to it and basically improves the absorption of uh, reabsorption of phosphate into the bloodstream as shown here. It causes elevation of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which improves phosphate and calcium absorption and leads to healing of rickets. There have been three important trials carried out in children. The first one was phase two open label uh, trial to, uh, to basically establish the, the dose and the dose frequency. There was another uh, phase two trial done in younger children. The most important one, in my opinion, is the, the phase three trial, which, contrared, uh, con which compared uh, con children with uh, conventional treatment with virizumab. Um, uh, uh, and uh, basically, the main message is that birozumab was superior to conventional treatment in healing records and normalizing the biochemistry. So in children with XLH, birozumab treatment um, resulted in improved serum um, phosphate, DMP, GFR, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, and ALP. It significantly improved and healed records despite previous treatment with conventional treatment. It improved linear growth and muscle function. Um, there were no meaningful changes in serum PTH during calcium excretion or on renal ultrasound scan. And uh, the adverse effects were mainly confined to injection site uh, changes. This is given subcutaneously every two weekly in children. So the management of XLH is uh, through a disciplinary team approach requiring all these um, colleagues working in concert to deliver the best care for these children. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Gazal, for this excellent presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rasha Hamza. Uh, Rasha is uh, a professor of pediatric endocrinology at Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. She is the chair of the education and training at the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology, and she is a vice president of the Arab Society for Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes. Uh, Professor Russia has many international publications, and she's been a guest speaker in regional and international uh, conferences. Uh, Professor Russia is going to talk today about advances and short stature. So, uh, Professor Russia. Let's all welcome you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Haya, for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the kind uh, invitation. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, advances in uh, short stature. And uh, to be honest, when I was preparing this talk, uh, I kept thinking a lot because the topic is very wide. Uh, how shall I collect uh, short stature in 25 minutes? So I thought to discuss some debatable items in short stature when there is uh, no clear yes or no, and the areas of overlap or gray zone in uh, short stature. And uh, let me start by this funny cartoon. Uh, when all parents come to our clinic as pediatric endocrinologists asking, am I short or not? And we keep explaining that most of the population lie at the middle of the bell curve with some of them being extremely short and others being extremely tall. So uh, growth is a process starting from prenatal life to adolescence being affected by a lot of factors in the prenatal period. Insulin and growth factors take the upper hand in addition to maternal health, nutrition and placental function. In infancy, proper nutrition is essential. In childhood, growth hormone 
and thyroid take the upper hand. And finally, in puberty, we need a synergistic effect of sex steroids working hand in hand with growth hormone to establish the growth spurt. And as you see, of course, we all know a lot of factors affect the growth and a lot of causes being involved. So indeed, short stature is not simple. And this is the very simple way of thinking about short stature when facing a short child. If there is dysmorphic features, this is syndromic short stature. Disproportion takes us to the category of disproportionate short stature. If proportionate and not dysmorphic, we first exclude the normal variants. And then the next step, undernutrition, chronic illness, SGA, endocrine disease. And if we do not reach all these, then we call it idiopathic short stature, which is in fact, not very clear to the point. Nothing is idiopathic after genetic testing. I think in most of the cases, we can reach a cause. And going to the investigations, starting from the baseline and going more and more towards genetic testing. We start, of course, by the baseline investigations, the celiac screening, the karyotype, and then the endocrine assessment, putting them together with the bone age, the MRI, cella tosica, which is a very essential tool. And finally, the highest and most advanced is genetic testing, which is not routine in my country, but definitely it is a very important tool for diagnosing the final cause of short stature. And this is a taste of our golden tools at our pediatric endocrinology clinics. And what we do is that we put these tools together and try to fit the results of them in addition, of course, to neuroradiology and MRI and genetic testing, if available, trying to reach the final diagnosis upon which the treatment will depend. It's very important to watch our step when dealing with children with short stature, because as I told you, it's not as simple as it might appear. And to avoid the pitfalls in the diagnosis and management of short stature. Of course, basal growth hormone has no role. We need two growth hormone provocative tests to diagnose growth hormone deficiency, but there are some exceptions that I'm going to mention. Thyroid functions should be done prior to growth hormone stimulation test, and the thyroid should be corrected before doing the test. Karyotype for short girls, because not all Turner girls have the typical dysmorphic features. A normal bone age excludes endocrinal disease. MRI cella tosica could be the clue to reach the final diagnosis, as I will show you in the cases. And of course, it's important to exclude normal variants, nutritional, chronic illness before jumping to endocrinal disease. And this is the list of the approved indications for growth hormone therapy and Noonan syndrome was recently approved in Europe as well in 2020, in addition to being FDA approved. Now, let me take you to a closer look or a zoom to some debatable conditions in short stature. And let me start by this very classical story, a 10-year-old girl presenting with short stature, normal birth weight and length. She came very short, height SDS minus four and a half, poor growth velocity, the typical doll-like face with excess abdominal fat. And looking at the growth chart, as you see, she was born normal. She started to plateau her height and decelerate at the age of three years. Her celiac screening, thyroid, cortisol, all were normal. And when we did the two stimulation tests, she was found to have a very low growth hormone. She failed both tests. The IGF-1 was low, and even when calculating the SDS, it was very low. The bone age, markedly delayed. So this is a very straightforward case, the typical diagnosis of isolated growth hormone deficiency. And looking at the MRI cella tosica, the girl was found to have anterior pituitary hypoplasia, as you see. Looking closely at the molecular mechanism of action of growth hormone, Imagine that this is the wall of the liver cell, and this is the liver cell membrane. 
As you know, the growth hormone receptor is formed of two parts, and each part has got an extracellular, transmembrane, and intracellular portion. What happens is that growth hormone molecule binds to its receptor, and the two parts of the growth hormone receptor come close together, being dimerized. And then JAK2 binds to the receptor with addition of a phosphate group, leading to phosphorylation of the receptor JAK2 complex. And then binding to stat protein occurs addition of a phosphate group, and the phosphorylated stat enters the nucleus, causing transcription of target protein, stimulating MAP kinases, producing IGF-1 into the circulation, leading to the growth-promoting effect. So we can easily hypothesize that any mutation at any of these steps could lead to a faction of the growth hormone IGF axis. And here you can see in the first box the consensus guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of growth hormone deficiency proposed by the Growth Hormone Research Society. It's important to exclude hypothyroidism first, then do two growth hormone provocative tests supported by IGF-1 plus or minus IGF binding protein 3. Pituitary MRI is required in all confirmed patients with growth hormone deficiency, and there are some few exceptions that I will mention for doing the test. Most of the references agreed for a cutoff of less than 7 nanograms per ml to diagnose growth hormone deficiency in children. But another important point is to take care of the interassay variability. In the box on the right side, you can see various cutoff limits according to different assays, but generally speaking, the cutoff is less than seven. And the question that I raised, do we always need to do two growth hormone provocative tests to assess growth hormone IGF axis? And the answer is no. In most of the cases, we need two tests, but there are some exceptions. We need one growth hormone provocative test if there is a CNS pathology, multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, a proven genetic defect or congenital malformation seen by MRI. Also, we do not need to do growth hormone stimulation test at all. If you have a clear syndrome, the Turner, Noonan, Pradovili, SGA, and chronic renal insufficiency. So these are the exceptions for not doing two growth hormone provocative tests. Now let's go back to our case, the 10 year old girl who was found to have low growth hormone by two test. And let me raise this question. Would you like to do priming or not before growth hormone provocation at this girl, a 10 year old girl? This is another debatable zone to prime or not to prime before growth hormone stimulation. Some authors suggest priming as it reduces the false positive rate of growth hormone provocative tests. Others believe that priming briefly augments the growth hormone response, which then returns to suboptimal concentrations and may result in failure to treat children with transient peripubertal growth hormone deficiency. Another group find that it's essential to prime those children only with delayed puberty, and this is a part in between. And the protocol of priming is giving IM testosterone, 100 milligrams IM 7 to 10 days before testing. In girls, oral estrogen, 10 to 20 milligrams ethanol estradiol, 48 to 72 hours before testing. And again, around a third to a half of pediatric endocrinologists routinely prime all peripubertal children prior to growth hormone stimulation. And this is for girls above the age of eight and boys above the age of nine. In spite of that, it's still a debatable point for discussion. What about obesity? Obesity indeed reduces growth hormone secretion. Visceral obesity increases somatostatin tone. It increases the insulin, the free fatty acid, and decreases the ghrelin, leading to reduced growth hormone deficiency, ending by dyslipidemia, inflammation, and cardiovascular risk. And the vicious circle goes on. 
So there is a blunted response to growth hormone provocative test giving a false positive result in obese children. And therefore, we need BMI specific cutoff levels for peak growth hormone provocative test in childhood and puberty. So we need to take care if we are dealing with obese child or adolescent. And if you have an obese short child, exclude hypothyroidism and hypercorticalism because it will as well lead to a false positive or low growth hormone stimulation test. What about measurement of serum IGF-1? IGF-1 varies with age and unfortunately, the normal range for serum IGF-1 in young children overlaps with the range in children with growth hormone deficiency. Another point is that IGF-1 is reduced in those with chronic undernutrition, hypothyroidism, chronic illness, renal failure, and diabetes. So you could have falsely lower results. Also, IGF-1 rises dramatically during puberty, and thus in a child with delayed puberty and low growth velocity, the IGF-1 for age may appear low, although the bone age adjusted and puberty stage adjusted IGF-1 could be normal. So it's very important to calculate the IGF-1 SDS adjusted for the puberty and the bone age. In infants, the situation is even more critical. This is a 20-day-old newborn who presented with neonatal jaundice, full-term, normal birth weight and length. The baby presented with recurrent generalized tonic-clonic convulsions, micropenis, otherwise normal genitalia, and depressed nasal bridge. All the labs were normal apart from indirect hyperbilirubinemia and the random blood sugar came very low, and it was not responding to usual lines of treatment. It kept very low in spite of giving glucose. So the next step was to withdraw a critical sample. We found ketotic hypoglycemia, and the rest of the endocrine profile was fine, apart from a very low growth hormone in the critical sample in spite of having hypoglycemia. So the diagnosis here was congenital growth hormone deficiency. And the clue was hypoglycemia and micropenis because this is a neonate. MRI cellatosica found ectopic posterior pituitary with a genesis of the infundibular stalk. Indeed, the MRI cellatosica is a very useful tool for diagnosing the cause of growth hormone deficiency or panhypopituitarism. And you can see a lot of varieties and abnormalities in the pituitary leading to either idiopathic growth hormone deficiency or part of panhypopituitarism. And please remember that the presence of an abnormality within the hypothalamopituitary axis by MRI provides a powerful supporting evidence for diagnosing growth hormone deficiency and it will affect the future treatment as well. Now, looking closely to genetics of short stature, the genetic causes are highly heterogeneous. It could be prenatal or postnatal, mild or severe, abnormalities in the growth hormone IGF axis, part of endocrinopathies or skeletal dysplasias or specific syndromes. And there are new generation sequencing techniques that will discover more genes implicated in the regulation of growth, resulting in novel therapies. So the technical approach ranges from CGH array up to whole genome sequencing. Indeed, genetic testing confirms the clinical diagnosis, but if available. And the whole genome sequencing will lead to novel disease genes upon which the treatment will differ. So as you've seen, short stature is a multifaceted diagnosis, fitting the pieces of the puzzle together to reach the final diagnosis. Indeed, growth hormone is needed throughout life. And a critical part of life is transition phase. We need to bridge the gap between childhood and adulthood. The transition phase is the period between late puberty 
and the near final height. And what we really need is to cross the bridge safely. We all know that the effects of growth hormone differ in different periods of life. In childhood and puberty, linear growth is needed and therefore we give higher doses of growth hormone. In adulthood, we need growth hormone for metabolic purpose for which lower doses are needed. And in between lies transitional phase, the critical period that we need to cross safely. So the plan to deal with patients with growth hormone deficiency during transition phase needs three steps. First, do we need to retest growth hormone or not? What is the approach if growth hormone testing is needed? And finally, shall we continue growth hormone for life or stop growth hormone? Very critical decisions that need to be taken. And let me take you to this simple quiz. This is a 15-year-old girl with 45X Turner syndrome. Her height SDS is minus 2.7. She started growth hormone at the age of seven on cyclic therapy. Her growth velocity is one and a half centimeters a year and her bone age is 14.6. Now, let me ask you, would you like to retest growth hormone IGF axis in this Turner girl? The answer here is no. First, let me tell you, in Turner syndrome, as previously mentioned, we do not need to do a growth hormone stimulation test from the beginning. Karyotype is enough. And we do not need to retest. Would you like to continue growth hormone? Another no. The answer is no. In Turner syndrome, you just stop when the growth is completed. And in the following disorders, SGA, chronic renal disease, Turner, ISS, Prader-Billi, growth hormone therapy is stopped when linear growth is complete. There is some debate on the Prader-Billi whether to continue or not for the sake of the metabolic purpose. So in these conditions, retesting is not indicated. You just stop the growth hormone when growth is completed. So retesting growth hormone secretion in transition phase is like lights and shadows that we follow to reach the proper decision. And here you can see the guidelines for that published in 2016 in Hormone Research in Pediatrics. And this very nice paper classified this group into two groups, those with a low likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency and another group with high likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency. The low likelihood group, these are the patients previously diagnosed with idiopathic isolated growth hormone deficiency or idiopathic isolated growth hormone deficiency with only one additional pituitary hormone deficiency plus normal MRI with no organic or structural abnormalities. What about the high likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency? Those with proven genetic or molecular defect, confirmed structural midline abnormality, multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, growth hormone deficiency plus additional two pituitary hormones or organic brain lesion. And simply, if there is low likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency, retesting is needed because there is a chance to recover. And based on the retesting to decide whether to continue growth hormone or not. On the other hand, in the high likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency, retesting is not indicated. These are permanent. You just continue on growth hormone on the metabolic dose. So if there is a high likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency, retesting is not needed because growth hormone deficiency is confirmed. If there is a low likelihood of permanent growth hormone deficiency, it's important to have a growth hormone washout period, stop growth hormone for one month and do baseline IGF-1 level. If normal, then growth hormone deficiency is excluded. If low and the growth hormone stimulation is low, then growth hormone deficiency is confirmed and you will continue. So these are the guidelines published in Hormone Research in pediatrics. So this is the classical thing, but still there are some exceptions. Those who were previously exposed to cranial irradiation may become growth hormone deficient with time. 
anterior pituitary hypoplasia, ectopic posterior pituitary and normal pituitary stoke have a high possibility of recovering a normal growth hormone on retesting. So in these groups, retesting is recommended to decide on growth hormone therapy accordingly. On the other hand, if the child has got ectopic posterior pituitary with agenesis of the pituitary stoke, this is a permanent growth hormone deficiency. Do not retest and just continue on growth hormone therapy. Now, let's go back to our two cases with isolated growth hormone deficiency. Remember the two cases. The first one, isolated with anterior pituitary hypoplasia. Now, let me ask you, would you like to retest in order to decide in the future for growth hormone or not? Yes. In such a case, we should retest at transitional phase because anterior pituitary hypoplasia has a chance to recover. What about this case? Ectopic posterior pituitary with agenesis of the infundibular stalk. In such a case, just continue after the transitional phase on the metabolic dose of growth hormone for life because this is a permanent cause of growth hormone deficiency. ITT is the gold standard test for diagnosing growth hormone deficiency during transition phase. And the SP cutoff proposed was five nanograms per ml, while the cutoff proposed by Growth Hormone Research Society is six nanogram per ml to diagnose growth hormone deficiency in transition phase. And as you see, the growth hormone dosage differs in different periods of life. And the dose gets less going from children to transition phase until adulthood because the doses for linear growth are much higher than metabolic dose. Another question is when to retest? And the answer is when growth velocity is less than two to two centimeters a year. That is around 14 to 15 in girls, 16 to 17 in males. And finally, not all causes are due to growth hormone deficiency. Let me show you this 14-year-old boy who presented with short stature and delayed puberty, Tanner stage one. His dad gave history typically of being very short, then catched up his height and puberty, and he became normal. And if you look at the chart here, you can see that he was born normal. He became a short child. And then he plateaued his height at puberty and he had delayed puberty as well. The boy had microcytic hyperchromic anemia. His calcium was lowish. His vitamin D is low. Thyroid celiac was normal. The growth hormone stimulation test here was lowish. And let me tell you that priming was not done for this boy. It was done automatically. FSH LH were low and testosterone was low. His bone age is 10 years and the height age is 10 years as well. So the bone age is equal to the height age. And this is the typical diagnosis of constitutional delay in growth and puberty. And Professor uh, Jan Martin Witt beautifully showed how difficult it could be and how constitutional delay could overlap with pathological causes. So it's not always straightforward that it might appear. And the question, would you like to start growth hormone? Of course not. What we did classically here is to reassure and proper nutrition and low dose sex steroid could be added. The boy improved dramatically in the height and in the puberty and is doing fine. So this therapeutic test confirmed that this is a case of constitutional delay in growth and puberty. Now, looking at the spectrum of puberty, of course, we have precocious and delayed puberty. In between lies the normal pubertal range. But what is more challenging and difficult is the early but not precocious and the late but not delayed puberty. And we see a lot of early but not precocious puberty in my country, in Egypt, and I think in all Arab countries. And therefore, there are population differences indeed, and there are emerging differences in the definition of delayed and precocious puberty. Now, let me end by this nine-year-old girl who presented with short stature and what I call early puberty. 
nine year old. It's not precocious, but it's early. Her height is minus 2.8, tenor breast stage three. Her growth hormone stimulation is normal and the bone age is advanced. As you see, she's nine years, her bone age is 11 and a half. And here I'd like to take your opinion. Would you like to wait? Would you like to give growth hormone or would you like to combine growth hormone and GnRH analog? I'm sharing this because we see a lot from these case scenarios, early puberty and short stature, early but not precocious. So as you see, sometimes the decision is not that simple. This is a very recent article published in Endocrine Journal on combined therapy with GnRH analog and growth hormone, increasing the adult height in children with short stature and normal pubertal onset. They concluded that for adolescents with normal pubertal onset and short stature with or without ISS, combining GnRH analog and growth hormone therapy can effectively improve the adult height. And after treatment, ISS adolescents can reach the target height and the non-ISS can exceed the target height. Here you can see that the target height is improved in non-ISS and ISS, but better in the non-ISS group. Again, here you can see in the table, significant difference in both groups regarding the final adult height. Now, the other side of the story is an article published in the Journal of Pediatric Endocrinology and Metabolism. And the aim here was to study the benefit over the cost of combining treatment in girls with central precocious puberty and poor height prognosis, and in girls with idiopathic short stature and early puberty. They concluded that both groups had a total height gain of only five centimeters, and each centimeter costs 2,700 euros so per patient. So the question, is it worth it or not? And this treatment should be considered only in patients with extremely low height prediction and very early pubertal onset. So this is another side of the story. Is it worth it or not from the economical point of view? So as you've seen, sometimes when we ask ourselves, which way shall we go? It's not really easy to choose a typical way. And what if both ways could be right? Some say this way, the others say the other way, and both could be correct. So I think you agree not always black and white in medicine. There is always a gray zone, not only in short stature, but in pediatric endocrinology and in whole medicine. So I think the best is to treat on individual basis and to calculate the cost benefit ratio to avoid unnecessary use of growth hormone. What we need is to have more benefit with less cost and to minimize the side effects. So my conclusions are, as you've seen, diagnosis of short stature is a multifaceted condition. And some of the areas are really, really debatable and not easy. Be aware of interest variability when diagnosing growth hormone deficiency. And be aware when you're having an obese child. Most authors recommend priming prior to growth hormone provocation, especially if girl above eight and boys above nine. Obesity blunts the result of growth hormone stimulation test. Proper decision whether to retest or not is important in transitional phase to decide on future growth hormone treatment. And this is very critical. Growth hormone dosing differs in different phases of life according to whether it's needed for height or for metabolic purpose. Both delayed and precocious puberty affect the final height in various ways. And the growth puberty interplay is very complicated. And finally, calculating the cost benefit ratio is very important. And let me end by this very uh, impressive description. Short stature is not that simple. It's not really as easy as it might appear. It's a complicated issue that needs a lot of thinking, clinical and investigations. And I think there is more to come, especially with the advance in the genetic testing. And I hope we will be able to solve the debatable and the gray zones of short stature. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Rasha, for your extensive review. And uh, we would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Francis Hayes. 
is the Associate Clinical Chief of Endocrinology at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, so she's an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. She attended her medical school at University of College of Dublin, Ireland, and she also completed her residency program and fellowship program in the Ireland. Her clinical and research interests include male hypogonadism, in which she lectured and published widely in this manner. She's also interested her interest also in Turner syndrome, for which she is a co-director of the clinic at the MGH. Welcome you, floor is yours, uh, Doctora, to talk about Turner syndrome. Well, thank you very much. It's um, a real pleasure to join you today at the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes. And I'll be speaking today on Turner syndrome. It is obviously a, a wide topic. So I'll be focusing on these issues. It will be relatively um, superficial as opposed to a deep dive given the, um, the time constraints. But I'm going to touch on epidemiology, diagnosis, clinical presentation, and then some aspects of treatment. We've already had a beautiful lecture on um, growth hormone therapy for um, short stature, so I won't spend too much time on that, but also puberty, hormone therapy, and pregnancy, as well as some of the um, recommended uh, guidelines for screening. So um, Turner syndrome is due to complete or partial absence of that second X chromosome. And it occurs in about one out of every 2,500 female live births. One of the striking things about Turner syndrome is that about 99% of the Turner's um, fetuses miscarry. And so based on this, the prenatal prevalence is significantly higher um, than that seen postnatally. Recent data suggest that it actually may be even more common than we thought. And data from the UK Biobank, where they looked at X chrome aneuploidy in almost a quarter of a million women using SNP array, showed that the, the prevalence was actually four times higher than you'd expect. The majority of the cases um, in this cohort were actually um, mosaic patients, so a mixture of 45X and 46XX, and most were not aware of their condition. And there is a sense now that the um, proportion of 45X cases may be decreasing due to um, increased elective terminations. So the diagnosis is made by a karyotype of peripheral blood. And if you evaluate 20 cells, you'll identify at least 10% mosaicism with 95% confidence limits. A second tissue, which can be buccal mucosa or it can be skin fibroblasts, that should be sampled if the clinical suspicion of Turner syndrome is high and the blood karyotype is either normal or it shows low level of mosaicism. And, and an important concept um, with Turner syndrome is that the degree of mosaicism can vary in different tissues. So it may not be the same in the peripheral blood as it is in the ovary, as it is in the skin. So this is the characteristic karyotype you see here, the um, monogenic um, X chromosome. And the 45X karyotype is by far the most common. And that's seen in up to 50% of cases. Next most common karyotype would be a mixture of the normal 46XX and the monosomy X. And then you can have um, mosaicism with um, triple X. Um, some patients can also have some Y material, and that's seen in about um, 10%. And then you can get um, deletions of either the, um, the XP or XQ, or you can get a ring X, or you can get um, an isochromosome where you have um, duplication, for instance, of the um, long arm of the X. And the presence of Y material does have important clinical um, implications. As I said, about 10% of patients will harbor Y sequences. And it's important because up to 10% um, can develop a gonadoblastoma. And for that reason, gonadectomy is recommended. 
in patients who have masculinizing features on their exam, but you don't identify Y material on karyotype, then you could consider doing um, fish of the buccal mucosa or doing molecular screening for some Y chromosome sequences. So Turner syndrome gets its name from Henry Turner, um, shown here, um, who published a paper um, in the 1930s describing a number of girls who, um, had, who were short, who had congenital webbing of the neck and cubitus valgus or this wide carrying angle. It was several decades later before the um, chromosomal basis for this condition was identified. So Turner syndrome should be considered in the following situations and, and a carrier type done. If you have a fetus with a cystic hygroma, as we heard in the last talk, if you have a child with idiopathic, a girl with idiopathic short stature, obstructive left-sided congenital heart defects, unexplained delayed puberty, infertility where there is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, or if you've got the characteristic facial features, which we will go through. So this is a typical um, patient that I'm sure many of you will um, recognize as a typical of um, a girl with Turner syndrome. And you can see that there is a um, short broad neck or webbing. There tends to be some um, downward slanting palpebral fissures, low set ears, micronathia, um, a narrow um, and a narrow palate. And the diagnosis can sometimes be made prenatally. This can either be incidental during chorionic venous sampling, amniocentesis, or use of cell-free DNA in women who are of advanced maternal age. Or it can be done when there are some characteristic features present on ultrasound. And shown here is the thickened nuchal fold. And over here, you have a cystic um, hygroma fluid collection due to disruption um, of the um, lymphatic system. So postnatally, there are three peaks in diagnosis. So childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. And the median age at diagnosis is 15, and about 50% of cases um, are not diagnosed until um, adulthood. One of the striking features um, in neonates is the presence of lymphedema. So you can see here the, um, the puffy feet, and that's also true of the hands. Other features in childhood obviously are short stature, there can be recurrent uh, episodes of otitis media um, leading to the need for myringotomy tubes and causing um, some hearing loss, um, as well as congenital heart defects. In adolescence, um, it can be diagnosed during workup for um, absence of pubertal development or primary amenorrhea. And then in the um, adult women, it can be diagnosed in the evaluation of secondary amenorrhea, recurrent pregnancy loss, and infertility. Many efforts have been made to correlate the karyotype and phenotype. And as a general rule, the severity of the phenotype does correlate with the percentage of cells that have a single X. And so if you have a single um, short arm of the X, these patients are more likely to have lymphedema, the cardiac abnormalities, diabetes, and neuropsychiatric issues. Whereas if there's mosaicism, the cardiovascular and the, and the lymphatic abnormalities in particular um, are less likely to be present. But one of the really striking things is that only one gene has actually been linked with the specific phenotypic feature of Turner syndrome. And that is the um, Shox gene, which is a um, pseudoautosomal gene. And we know that decreased um, expression of, of shocks has been associated with um, the short stature and the skeletal deformities uh, in these patients. So the phenotype depends not just on the copy number variation of X chromosome genes that escape um, X inactivation, 
But we also know that there's altered expression of autosomal genes, and there may be um, some epigenetic changes that can contribute. So why is Turner syndrome an important condition to diagnose and treat? First of all, it's one of the most common chromosome disorders. And secondly, the mortality is increased threefold with a 15 year reduction in lifespan. The major causes of death are cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And early diagnosis, particularly of the cardiovascular um, um, abnormalities and correction of these can result in reduced morbidity and mortality. There's relatively limited data on the impact of hormone therapy on long-term outcomes. But there was a recent paper published last year in um, JCNM from the Danish group with Klaus um, Grafholt. And that showed that in over a thousand women with um, Turner syndrome, those who were treated with um, hormone therapy, but it was, it was a mixture of hormone therapy. Some were getting oral, some transdermal estradiol and some oral contraceptives. But compared to those who were not being treated, those who received hormone therapy had a lower um, risk of diabetes, stroke, and um, osteoporosis um, fragility fractures. Um, they did not see a significant difference, however, in mortality. Um, it may be that they needed a larger study, and it would also have been um, cleaner if they had their population receiving just physiologic hormone replacement, as well as a combination of that and oral contraceptives. So there are some general principles to managing patients with um, Turner syndrome um, that I think are important. And the first is the, um, the need for multidisciplinary input. A second um, key parameter is to facilitate the smooth transition from pediatric to adult care, because many patients um, are, are lost during this transition. And the Endocrine Society has put forward a document and guideline to, to facilitate this and to um, give pointers to physicians of how to give increasing responsibility to adolescents to assume um, their own care. Treatment priorities obviously change according to age. So growth hormone therapy is very important in childhood. In adult patients, then it changes to um, hormone replacement, addressing infertility and uh, cardiovascular risk. And it's also important to um, be familiar with the guidelines for screening. So by its nature, Turner syndrome management requires input from multiple specialties. We're gonna focus mainly on um, endocrine, but um, critical role also for cardiology, GI, renal, and neuropsychiatry. Um, and the OBGYN um, um, specialists are needed uh, to um, imp um, give input on fertility. So from an endocrine perspective, the abnormalities include short stature, which is seen in the vast majority of these patients, as is gonadal failure. Um, diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, are significantly more common than age match controls. And um, either subclinical or overt hypothyroidism are seen in up to half of these patients. Um, osteoporosis is also um, more common and um, particularly in those who do not adhere to um, hormone replacement. I mentioned the left-sided cardiac abnormalities. So you can see a bicuspid valve in about a third, coarctation, dissection, hypertension, and coronary artery disease. Um, from the renal perspective, you can get a horseshoe kidney, duplication, or aplasia. Elevated liver function tests are commonly seen in these patients, sometimes due to fatty liver, other, other times focal nodular hyperplasia or other vascular abnormalities. And then both celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease um, are significantly more common. Many women with Turner syndrome have nonverbal learning differences um, that, that can create challenges during childhood and sometimes require um, some special ed, um, education um, support. 
depression and anxiety are more common and self-esteem tends to be a little bit lower than XX uh, controls. And um, many patients will want to um, have an assessment of fertility and what their options are in this regard. So this is just from the um, European Journal of Endocrinology, which gives some um, screening guidelines for Turner syndrome, both in childhood and in adults. Um, I'm not going to go through everything, but essentially it's things like your weight, your blood pressure, and then all of the conditions we mentioned. So thyroid function, liver function tests, hemoglobin A1C, and fasting glucose because of the increased risk of diabetes, um, parameters to assess vitamin D and bone health, um, kidney function, um, and skin examination because of an increased risk of um, nevi and melanoma. So just briefly talking about short stature. So the average height of a woman with Turner syndrome is 143 centimeters. And on the right, you can see the growth curves for girls without Turner syndrome in the blue, and those um, with Turner syndrome who are untreated um, in the red. And you see that untreated, even the tallest girls so with Turner syndrome, so those on the 95th percentile, barely reach the 5th percentile for those with um, 46XX karyotype. But uh, um, as you probably realized from the previous talk, girls with Turner syndrome are not growth hormone deficient per se. They have normal growth hormone secretion, but their short stature is due to haploinsufficiency of the shox gene. Left untreated, their final height is 20 centimeters left than controls. And we have um, many years experience now of using growth hormone to treat short stature with average gains in height of five to eight centimeters. So these are data from the Canadian Growth Hormone Advisory Committee. And so this is baseline for a group of Turner syndrome patients, some of whom were randomized to receive growth hormone in the black circles, and some of which served as uh, controls and were untreated in the open circles. And these growth curves are for um, Turner syndrome. And you can see that following treatment, the majority of patients who um, are in the um, highest uh, quartile for, for height are those that received growth hormone, whereas the open circles tend to be between um, lower than the 50th uh, percentile. So it's the recommendation is to start growth hormone therapy when the height falls below the fifth percentile, and usually that's somewhere between the ages of two and six. And a starting dose of 45 to 50 micrograms per kilogram once daily subcutaneously is recommended. And the goal is to keep the IGF-1 level no greater than two standard deviations above the mean for age. And growth hormone therapy should be continued until the bone age reaches 14 and the growth velocity is less than 2.5 centimeters per year. So factors that are associated with greater height include taller height at the start of therapy, higher mid-parental height. I have one patient who is um, five foot 10 because she has very tall parents. Young age at initiation, longer duration of therapy and higher growth hormone dose. Um, for patients with very short stature, in addition to um, treating with growth hormone, you could consider adding the non-aromatizable androgen oxandrolone, which can give an extra uh, 4.6 centimeters. Or you can delay induction of puberty. So instead of starting estrogen at 11 or 12, you can defer until um, 14 and use a um, GnRH agonist like Lupron to, um, um, if, 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 you, if the child is showing any um, signs of spontaneous puberty. So I mentioned that ovarian failure is um, one of the sort of pathognomonic features of Turner syndrome. So it's seen in up to 90% of cases. Shown here on the left is the streak ovary um, of a patient with Turner syndrome. And on the two panels on the right, it's the microscopic appearance of a Turner's patient here, where you can really only see the fibrous stromal tissue. You've got no follicles. Uh, and this compares to the view of a normal ovary 
on the right where you can see um, both follicles and the background of the fibrous stroma. But what's interesting is that um, in patients with Turner syndrome, the peak germ cell mass at 20 weeks is actually similar to the 46X controls. So they have about six to seven million germ cells. But then there's accelerated um, apoptosis. So that by time of birth, this number is down to a million. And by the time um, of pubertal onset, it's, um, it's about um, 400,000. The typical hormonal profile is that of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So elevated FSH, low estradiol, low levels of anti-malarian hormone, AMH, and undetectable in Hibin B. But important to recognize that the FSH shows a biphasic pattern. And so during, um, as you're aware, there's a sort of a mini puberty in um, um, infancy. So you can have um, a normal FSH in both um, Turner's and um, 46XX um, girls. And during childhood, then the FSH level may not be different in a girl with a Turner syndrome versus controls. But it's typically over the age of 10 that you will see it increase into the menopausal range. There is a significant spectrum ovarian, of ovarian function in Turner syndrome, and up to 30% can have spontaneous breast development. 15% can reach menarche. Most of the patients who do are mosaic, and they will go on to develop oligomenorrhea and primary ovarian insufficiency. It is also possible to get pregnant spontaneously if you have Turner syndrome. The likelihood is low, it's about five to 7%. And even those who do conceive have a high risk of miscarriage um, approaching 45%. So in terms of treatment, so if a um, girl is showing no evidence of um, spontaneous pubertal development, then we can certainly induce it. And the goal is to mimic normal puberty and maximize growth and psychological development. And so estradiol therapy is typically started at um, 11 or 12. If you have evidence that there is no spontaneous uh, puberty, so the FSH is um, high and the AMH is low. Depending on the um, tanner staging and the growth velocity and bone age, you can increase the dose by anything from 25 to 100% every six months, aiming to reach adult doses over two to three years. And then progesterone is added once breakthrough bleeding occurs or after two years of estrogen therapy. Very important not to start a prepubertal um, girl with Turner syndrome on a birth control pill, um, which will really not result in proper um, breast growth. In adult women, the preferred regimens are transdermal or oral 17 beta estradiol. And that's then used with either continuous or cyclical micronized progesterone. The recommendation is to continue treatment until the average age of menopause, which is about 51. And the benefits include improvements in the lipid profile, bone health, vascular function, and interestingly, decrease in liver function tests. Sometimes you'll have hepatologists wanting to stop estrogen um, when they see um, these abnormalities in liver function, but actually um, uh, the um, physiologic estradiol uh, replacement can cause them to improve. Use of oral contraceptives should be limited to women who are still having periods and who desire contraception. And these are the recommended replacement options. So for both initiation of puberty and in adults. And you can see the striking differences in the doses for transdermal estrogen. So three to seven micrograms. So you're going to be cutting up um, whatever the lowest dose patch that is available to you to get this very low dose. In um, adulthood, then you can typically will use um, doses of um, uh, 50 to 100 micrograms per day. If a patient doesn't want to use the patch, you can use um, oral, but we um, tend to avoid ethanol estradiol, which is the most thrombogenic estri um, estrogen and um, also has less favorable effects on bone. 
So for women with Turner syndrome, infertility um, is really one of the main issues that impacts their quality of life. And in one review of almost 300 women in the US, 88% had no children. And the, the barriers here include reduced ovarian function, obviously. Um, but the second sort of hit for women with uh, Turner syndrome is the increased cardiovascular risk. So you can have somebody who has um, primary ovarian insufficiency because of an autoimmune condition um, who would be a great candidate for donor egg because they don't have the um, cardiovascular abnormalities that patients with Turner syndrome have. So there are significant risks with pregnancy um, in Turner syndrome, and those are both to the mother and to the fetus. And those risks include hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, aortic dissection, and, um, and, and even death. The baby is at risk of being low birth weight. There's an increased risk of fetal congenital anomalies and aneuploidy, and an increased risk of fetal loss. And so preconception counseling is critical. All um, Turner syndrome um, pregnancies should be carefully planned um, and based on shared decision-making with an appropriately informed patient. They need to be counseled about the increased cardiovascular risk that is associated with pregnancy, and they need to be seen by a cardiologist. Those who are still having periods should be counseled that the likelihood of getting pregnant spontaneously decreases rapidly with age. And so they might consider um, egg freezing or um, if they already have a partner, um, um, starting a family earlier than they might otherwise would um, want. Also important to review other options for motherhood, including adoption or use of a gestational carrier. And so if you look at all of the fertility options available, so as I mentioned, spontaneous pregnancy is rare, but can occur. And, but for most patients, it's some type of assisted reproductive technology. Sometimes that can be with their own oocytes, although the um, pregnancy rates here um, are low at about 8%. Donor oocytes can be used if um, they um, don't have significant cardiovascular disease. Um, if they do and they're at risk of dissection, they may choose the option of a gestational carrier. And obviously adoption is always um, an option, although it can be an expensive one. But the key thing here is that you need a multidisciplinary team taking care of these women that would include maternal fetal medicine and cardiology. So um, one exciting area um, in the um, treatment of Turner syndrome uh, patients is this option of fertility preservation. So cryopreservation of oocytes can be offered to girls if they're over 12 and they have some evidence of ovarian function. And the follicle yield does tend to be highest in those who have mosaicism. In the future, it may be possible to cryopreserve cortical ovarian tissue rather than the oocytes, but this is still experimental, but it could be an option for prepubertal girls um, down the road. So to summarize, I would say that the care of women with Turner syndrome is best provided by a multidisciplinary team and that facilitating smooth transition from pediatrics to adult um, medicine is critical. Hormone therapy should be initiated at 11 to 12 and continued until average age of menopause. And the transdermal route of estrogen administration is preferable. All women with Turner syndrome should be counseled about the increased uh, cardiovascular risk associated with pregnancy. And those young women who have persistent ovarian function should be informed about oocyte cryopreservation as an option to preserve fertility. IVF with autologous or with donor oocytes should only be considered after appropriate screening and counseling. So I'm going to stop there, but I would like to um, thank you very much for your um, attention this, it's this evening. It's morning here, but evening with you, I believe. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis, for this excellent presentation. And now we'll have about five minutes of discussion. So I would like to invite all the speakers. Uh, the first May question. I ask uh, something uh, to Dr. Hamza. It was a very nice talk, Dr. Hamza. 
You mentioned in the beginning that an MRI should be made in all short stature kids. Is that what I understood? But usually no, no. we only do that if we have a strong suspicion of. Yes, yeah, I didn't say in all short stature. Uh, I mean, in cases with documented growth hormone deficiency. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have also a question to uh, Prof. Hamza. Uh, Doctor, we face patients with type 1 diabetes and we are following them up to 18. So we found initially their growth velocity is normal. And as they grow, on, a uh, few of them, they have they regress yeah, and their growth velocity start to decelerate. Shall we start them in empirical growth hormone or do you recommend to do for them growth hormone stimulation test? Uh, thank you very much. A very uh, challenging question. Uh, let me first stress on the point that we need to have a good A1C. It should be seven or less because some diabetics come saying we are not growing well, we're not having puberty and the A1C is 11 or 12. So we need to have a good A1C. We need to make sure thyroid function and celiac screening are fine, no other abnormalities. And then if the child is not growing well, yes, we can do a growth, growth hormone stimulation but it, of course, it's not an FDA approved indication. It's not um, a classical thing to give growth hormone to a diabetic child because it will affect the doses. And some references highlighted that it could have a role in accelerating the microvascular complications. So I think it should be individualized and it's not something that should be done in every case. Very, very much individualized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for uh, Professor. Uh, the question is, uh, what LHRA stimulation test do you use in your practice and what are the doses of testosterone you're using and hypo-hypo versus CGD? I'm not sure if I heard the question exactly. Uh, I think we do the standard GnRH test, so that is a dose of 100 microgram if I'm... Correct, and uh, of course, in the literature, there's some uncertainty about the cutoffs because also the various assays give different results. So you have to speak, I think, with your lab person, actually, what would be in your lab with that assay actually the best, yeah, limit. Uh, the next question is uh, to Dr. Uh, Francis. I think you've answered this question. Is there any role for growth hormone in late diagnosed cases of Turner syndrome? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the role really is to uh, optimize growth. So if it's diagnosed in somebody who has um, um, already either shown signs of puberty or started estrogen, there is no role for growth hormone. As um, we discussed earlier, th th these um, patients are not growth hormone deficient. Um, but um, in adult um, patients with Turner syndrome, there's currently no role for growth hormone therapy. Thank you very much. Okay, there's a question to uh, Dr. Arasha. Any indication for growth hormone in sickle cell disease patients with short stature despite a normal IGF-1? Uh, again, this is uh, another uh, non-classical thing. Uh, we give yes in hemoglobinopathies, but it's not an FDA approved indication, uh, whether in those of beta thalassemia major or in those with sickle cell disease. If the child is very short, we can give a trial, but this is not an FDA approved condition. Uh, just one more point, in thalassemic patients, we need to make sure, and in any, any uh, of these categories, that the ferritin is not exceeding 1000, because if the ferritin is very high, the child will not grow well, whatever uh, we give. So we need to do good iron chelation therapy first and then make sure the fasting glucose and insulin are not high. And then we can give growth hormone if the child is very short. You're speaking about sickle cell anemia and thalassemia or sickle dwarfism? Sickle cell disease. Yes. So I'm correct then. My answer is on the line. Okay. Yes. It's in the right track. Okay. Uh, if there is no more questions, we'd like to thank all of our speakers for this extensive review. It is nice to meet you, inshallah. We hope next year we can meet uh, physically with Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you.